shaped and the concepts evolved after, generally, I've worked in several different ways actually, but generally the film takes shape after it's, the footage has been collected. And so um, I find, I try to find the film, if there is one, in the footage uh, rather than to proceed with a concept beforehand. But even as I say this, I, I want to emphasize that that's not a rule because I've worked in very different ways than that too. So, uh, but this film uh, is, is a demonstration of that, uh, which I, I think is the most typical kind of uh, approach to filmmaking that I've had, and that is to find the film after the fact, rather than to try to match a conception or, or, or an idea that I have beforehand. Well, yeah, I mean, this one really takes it a lot farther than, like, for instance, Great Blondino, which showed last night. That film, you, you shot footage over a period of time, and then it, over a course of about a year after, you, you know, created the completed film from that with no script and no, I mean, even while you were shooting, not necessarily any idea of how the finished piece would come out. And same with this one, but at the same time, this one, I mean, some of the footage dates from as early as 70, 71, and then you finished it in 97, and I mean, a lot of the footage in this film wasn't necessarily made for this film even. But no, none once, of it. But once, yeah, none of it. I mean, once, and once you got in the mid-90s to working on this, you were looking at all this footage from uncom incomplete projects and so forth, and tests and so forth, and uh, it's, I, it's, it's a bigger uh, challenge, I think, in some ways. Than, I mean, none of the footage, well, I mean, you, you're, it, an incredible amount of limitation that you're putting on yourself to work with footage that wasn't even shot for the film you're working on. Yeah, well, I don't think of it as a limitation, or you know, but I, 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 or, I think I mean, of it as as an expanded as expanded possibilities because the film doesn't have to be anything other than what it suggests. It doesn't have to be seventy minutes long, or forty minutes long, or ten minutes long, or or it may even not be a film in the box. You know, um, the big difference between this and Blondino is that when we shot Blondino, we shot it for over, um, I think. Well, it was all shot within a year. It was actually only a few, not that many times that we went out on weekends and, and shot the, uh, the footage. But there, not that the film was con preconceived, it wasn't, but there was a, uh, there was a, um, a consistency of, uh, of, of elements, namely the, the character Blondino and uh, the idea of a tightrope or, or and in other words, that was more of a specific project, still open-ended, whereas this is more from a big box of black and white footage of various projects over the years. So Blondino, all of the footage for Blondino that was made during that year was for that film, whatever it was going to be, and whereas this was all, um, some 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 of the some of the footage in here I did have an idea for a film that never you know progressed and then it just became footage and then later on uh, I made this film out as I say out of a box of black and white footage I kept two big stashes of film in my studio one was a box of black and white and the other is a box of color both of them date back as far as 30 years ago or 25 years ago or something in terms of collection of footage. Um, the color box I haven't touched yet. I still, that's still a film, if there is one in there, and I think there might be, that's still a film I have to make uh, and to find if there is one there. Uh, the black and white box I finally took care of after all those years. This is the film. <laughs> and you just saw it. <laughs> Pardon? And you just saw what you, you know. Yeah, what you this was the film. Do you have the feeling there is an autobiographical element in some way to this to this work? Uh, yes, very much so. In but uh, but very um, uh, symbolically stated and nothing uh, literal. There's no there's nothing in it that um, uh, is you know factually autobiographical. I. Um, I well, I can say, I've never said this before to anybody, I, mean, I don't think I'll tell you, but, but since you asked, uh, when uh, I think of um, 
as I tried to invent that, well, okay, let me just say briefly first that um, in, in <clears throat> making this film, I had pieces of film that I really liked for one reason or another, and I tried to project a story into that footage to make a, a, a fiction that, I, I mean, the footage could, is just uh, uh, like, for instance, the girly show on the, on the stage. That's just a nice, from my point of view, a, a nice piece of footage. I really liked that, that piece of film. But this, the story then, that story that appears in the text, um, makes those women into the, the main character's grandmother and his aunt and the guy behind the podium is his uncle and all that kind of stuff. And as I, <clears throat> as I imagined it uh, later, my, what, what was seemed autobiographical about it was um, I grew up in San Francisco and never met my grandparents, uh, any of them, because they're Swedes. And I never, you know, my parents were immigrants to the United States. And uh, so, uh, and not having, uh, uh, and being very rebellious as a teenager and escaping my parents, uh, uh, I, I mean, they couldn't do anything with me. They, they, were, they just gave up. They had to because there was, and there was no, there was no uh, kind of background of relatives to uh, confine me in some way. If I had grandparents, I, I realize now, I didn't realize this then, but if I had grandparents and all kinds of relatives in the background, I probably couldn't have gone as, as wild and escape my parents as much as I did. And so, <clears throat> in that sense, uh, I sort of I was just hungry for what, I didn't know what it was, but it seemed like a big party going on somewhere and I wanted to get there. I couldn't, I didn't know what it was, but that's what was my hunger. And my, and I think that um, in that sense, I made uh, American culture, just the most raw aspects of it were my grandparents. That's, in a, in a very brief or rough equation, my association that you sparked with your question uh, uh, to, as to w how it's personal or autobiographical. Uh, in a very, uh, as I said, not literal way in any sense. But Actually, Alex, you asked last night about the titles of Robert's films, and I, I don't think I've ever asked you about the title for this film, How I Told Big, what, do you want to say anything about that? Or no. You don't want to talk? Okay. <laughs> All right. The is there is a poet yeah. mentioned at the end, Robert Server. Robert, Robert Service. 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 What can you tell us about? Never well, I took, I, I, <clears throat> there, I took a long, to, to sort of develop the narrative, I took a long section from a poem called The Cre Cremation of Sam McGee. And that's when he drags the corpse through the wintry landscape, he finally brings him to the, um, he finds a, a place where he can cremate because he's fill, fulfilling a promise. Sam McGee as he's dying, it's not Sam McGee, it's Toto Big here. But Toto Big as he's dying makes the other guy promise that he'll cremate him if he dies. And so, uh, and this, this ties in with the poem from, uh, uh, if you ever see it, it's a Robert Service poem called The Cremation of Sam McGee. And Sam McGee, <clears throat> and in this case, Toto Big, but Sam McGee is brought to the crematorium by his friend who's trying to fulfill the promise. And he stuffs him in the roaring flames and expecting him to be cremated. But instead, uh, when he opens the door, he finds him for the first time warmed up and happy in there. Um, so, uh, I. I borrowed the, the main idea from, uh, from that film. In this case, when Sam McGee, although Toto Big rather, is, um, is transformed or reborn in the flames, he's the black man at the end who's, who's a voodoo man and who scares the other people. Um, so that, that's why I credited Robert Service, because I borrowed liberally from that, that poem. And it was a poem that I remembered as a kid when I was, you know, I don't know, eight, nine years old. I had uh, some family friends, um, some friends of my parents, uh, a friend of my parents, 
used to recite and perform that poem. And as a, for a little, as a little kid, it was very impressive to me. So I have always remembered that poem, and this time it got in the film. Although you, you rewrote it quite a bit. Pardon? You rewrote it. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, it's, um, only a few lines are similar. I rewrote it for, for, for this piece, yeah. Are there any questions at all? Um, I was very fascinated by the sound of the film. And for some parts, I couldn't decide whether to follow uh, the pictures or the sound. And the first thing, of course, I wanted to know is uh, the, the, how you produced it, uh, this film. Did you uh, decide uh, which picture uh, according to the sound, or was it the other way around? Did you do the sound by yourself? Those are things I would like to, to know first. Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> the sound is also a collection of sounds. So some of the sounds I did myself, and some of them are just like the hypnotist is a recorded sound that we, we recorded uh, a hypnotist doing that shot and him making that speech when we were in, in 1971, that page from that piece of film. Um, Never before in any film have I done uh, as much text in a film. This is uh, an unusual amount of text for me. And, um, but I knew, I, my impulse was to really uh, try to become, for once, just one time, I wanted to try to be a writer with this film. I wanted to write those texts. And I also needed that to make some kind, to, to, to try to, um, bridge the gap between what I was imagining from this footage, the fictional thing I was just talking about, to, uh, about bringing, um, uh, finding ideas in the footage that are, I'm projecting from my own life. To do that, I needed some kind of bridge and I just, I just used text for it. And because uh, the form of the film is abstract enough, it seemed to me possible to use contrasting images and text. It, I know it's sometimes difficult to perceive all of that one. I think it's a film um, that probably needs a couple of viewings to try to figure it out, you know, if, if it's possible. But so do you, have a, you had a pile of unused sound? Too. Yeah, well, when I say I had a box of black and white footage, I also had lots of sound that was going with it. Uh, like the sync sound of the girly show, for yeah. instance, all of that stuff, yeah. yeah. But then other, like the drums at the end or your son? That's my son, yeah. 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 And then the electronic music is, is Dave Borden. Dave Borden, who actually... You know yeah, he, well, he's kind of, he got to be kind of well known, I yeah. think, yeah. Electronic wow. music. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Any other uh, questions at all? Hmm? Those pieces of music were made for these images, or had they existed before? The yeah, no, he made it, he, the Dave Borden music? No, they weren't made for this, these images. It was made for, um, it was just music he gave me if I ever wanted to use it in a film. Actually, do you want to, um, the first film, Deep Western, this is uh, where the, everybody's falling over in the, the chairs. Um, the, I mean, uh, this is sort of made in, in homage to somebody, right? So right. Do, do you wanna, uh, Deep so Western, the first one, falling in the chair, was um, <clears throat> there was a, um, a dentist named Dr. Sam West who gave free dental work to uh, artists around the Bay Area, or at least in Marin County where I was living at the time and um, in exchange for our work. So, and he'd been doing this for a number of years and he was very appreciated by a lot of artists and their families because most artists at that, in, in those days, most of the artists I knew were surviving pretty minimally. Uh, some had, you know, Wiley had a good teaching job and so on, but a lot of people were really trying to uh, make ends meet. So the free dental work was an important uh, contribution. So, for that reason, he was really well liked and a friend of uh, of the artist. And he died uh, a fairly young man. He was, you know, in his, I guess he might have been fifty or something. But 
he was, uh, he died, I, I don't even remember what he died from, but because of that, uh, the idea to make a film, when we had the idea of making a film, we made the film as a kind of uh, tribute to him. So it was like a wake of, or something, or, or, or a, a dedicated to his honor or something like that. So that, the name Deep Western, um, he was cremated, so Ern West is in there deep, he's I'm buried, I don't know, anyway, he had sort of uh, death associations, and also the chairs falling over, a lot of death associations. And before we went, before we made the film, we agreed that we would all make a, a tombstone for our own tombstone, I mean a, a temporary one. <laughs> and uh, so those shot, those curved pieces at the very end, those were, the, the tombstones we all brought that we had each made uh, when we, that we had brought to the occasion where we met, on the day we made the film. It was all shot in a couple hours. A very simple film to make. Some of the films I've made are really very simple and that's, that's always kind of a, a refresher. It was refreshing to, uh, especially after some enormous complex film or what seems enormous and complex like Blondino or this one or what. Uh, to make a film that just takes one day to shoot and takes, you know, another day, um, some other day, some other time to uh, put the track together. I really, um, I really like some of the simple films I've made. Hot Leather Ed is a very simple film. This one, Offhand Jape. Those are all films made like in a couple days. And, uh, but other films like the one we just saw is, you know, <laughs> 30 years or something, <laughs> so there's a big, there's a big range of um, differences between those two possibilities. Yeah. And so yeah. listen, I'm not dodging your question about yeah. the Hauling Total Bay because I'm just dodging it, you know? The, the title? Yeah. 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 No, so okay. we'll talk about it some other time. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, actually, so in Deep Western, the people are Bill Geis and then Mike Henderson and you and then William and Wiley. Wiley. Yes. And uh, especially those of you that were here last night, you saw Offhanded Jape, which is Bob and, and Bill Wiley. Blue Shot on the soundtrack, it's you and Wiley. Clerk Great Blondino was made by you and Wiley. And I mean, Wiley, you guys have known each other for a really long time at this point. And We've known each other since um, like late 1957. 57. Yeah. And you're really, you know, you're close. You, you have a, you own land together, okay, you know? Like, yeah. I mean, all these things. Can, can you uh, maybe just talk a little bit about your collaboration over the years? You know, I mean, being really close friends and but collaborators as well. And yeah, 